in some way. In some ways. Uh, yeah. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you guys for coming in person and to everybody on Zoom. I appreciate you guys joining us too. Um, really delighted to introduce our CGIBD seminar speaker today, Dr. Matthew Chorba. Uh, Dr. Chorba is a professor of medicine at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Uh, as I was going through his uh, CV, <laughs> he carries multiple leadership positions, I realized. So let me know if I missed one. Missed yeah, okay. uh, Dr. Shorba is the director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center of Excellence there. He's the founding director of the IBD research program and the director of the Advanced Fellowship in IBD. He's also the associate director of the GI Fellowship program at the DDK T32 Basic Science Training Program. Dr. Shorba also co-directs the Precision Animal Models and Organoid Core at WashU's DDRC. That's our sister uh, P30 at IDDK Funding Center. I believe. Um, and his list of honors was too long to go over here, but suffice to say that he's been incredibly successful and has received significant recognition for his commitment to research patients and trainees alike. Um, I don't know how you get a chance to run a lab. Uh, good question. Uh, Dr. Shorba's research group is dedicated to defining pathways and mechanisms of intestinal inflammation and transition to colon cancer. His group does exciting work and recently, I think, utilized 2D IEC systems and organized to investigate uh, pathogens of SARS-CoV-2, for which I believe his group was awarded an R um, for the grant. I know this because I also applied because I granted it not. You know, Man's Lab continues to be funded with multiple R01s and other NITDK and NCI uh, funded. Uh, Dr. Kober received his undergraduate and doctorate of medicine at the University of Iowa. He completed his internship, residency, and fellowship at WashU and a fellowship in IVD uh, at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. His postdoctoral fellowships were with giants in the field, uh, Dr. Will Stenson, Pat Steppenberg, and Rodney Newberry. Uh, so amazing training and mentors. And over the last four years, I've actually interacted with Matt mostly on the DDKC study section, sort of handles a lot of career development <coughs> work, and I've learned a lot from him because I value and appreciate his commitment to how he fosters the, you know, the next generation of scientists. He's an advocate for them. His reviews are always thoughtful. Are focused, fair, uh, and done to help the candidate. So I learned something very really <laughs> helpful for the yeah. career stuff. <laughs> so without further ado, Matt. Thank, thank, thanks thank so much. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, it, it, it really, it's a, it's an honor to be here, and I'm so happy, and I appreciate uh, the invitation to be here. I was saying before that. Um, by the way, is it like a microphone? Oh, go ahead. It, it, it's, it's microphones all over here for the Zoom. Okay, good. Yeah, we, we, oh, we, I see. Oh, I want to check everything. We, we, we can hear you. Perfect. <laughs> we set up a room. It's not this nice, but it's terrible. We kept on trying to have these conferences and you couldn't hear anybody after. Anyway, I was uh, so, so I'm an MD only, but that does uh, uh, research and, and some clinical work. And I, um, I did a year of research between undergrad and medical school because I was interested in, I, I thought that maybe I would do a PhD in, instead or one in both. And so anyway, uh, but I was looking for places that, looking for, for residencies in internal medicine where you could do research. And so I interviewed at, um, at several, um, including UNC and Duke. And I can tell you that my experience 22 years ago was that at Duke, uh, which I did first. They took us out to a very fancy dinner in a tall thing where they swept up our, I'd actually, I'm from a small town in Iowa, so I'd never seen this, but they sweep up your crumbs uh, instead of like blow them away. Or um, and then they, they uh, uh, you know, when you get up to go to the bathroom, they fold your nap. I mean, you guys have seen it probably now, but anyway, then I came to UNC and we went to a, a to a, a group up. Um, and so anyway, I ranked the uh, UNC number two, um, but uh, WashU was a little closer to home, and so we ended up going to WashU. So it's a pleasure to be back here. It's changed a lot. Um, so I'm going to, I think I can just do it all here. So I'm going to tell you today a little bit, I think the background is MD only, you know, uh, certainly I spent a lot of time, you know, learning pathways and all the tools of science and that sort of stuff. But all along the way, of course, I've been interested in trying to uh, figure out the things that we do and make sure that they can translate to, to patients somewhere down below. And so I want to tell you a couple of stories about, uh, about how we've done that and where they are. So it's not going to be uh, Western block heavy. Um, it's not going to be um, uh, other graph heavy, but I'll touch on some of those things along the way. So at least you know that there really is science. And uh, 
So <laughs> when, the, when we had, um, you know, I have, I have some disclosure. I think the only one that's really relevant to this um, is that Insight, this company, uh, which is based in uh, on the East Coast, is um, uh, in Wilmington, is, is has provided drug and some support to conduct one of these clinical trials that we're doing. And so, uh, but it's all investigator initiated. Okay, so this is the outline. I'm going to tell you, and I'll just tell you the stories now, so it's not too complicated. But the first is, is that um, is is essentially that this tryptophan metabolizing enzyme called IDO1. Um, uh, we found to be a target in uh, colon cancer and then ultimately in rectal cancer. And so uh, we've started a clinical trial where we add this IDO1 inhibitor to neoadjuvant chemotherapy for rectal cancer. The second story is one uh, that Belfer knows and he, and he wishes I would have already published yet and we're very close. <clears throat> uh, but it's funded by a Litwin ID Pioneers Award which is essentially giving a dietary supplement called Toro Verso deoxycholic acid or TUDCA uh, to patients with ulcerative colitis. And so I'm gonna take you through some of that story as well. Um, and then finally, uh, I, I actually, on the, as I was putting these together, I thought I should have something that sort of sums things up. So I was thinking of some lessons that I've learned along the way. Uh, so I have two, two uh, slides of lessons, but they're not like a ton of words. So. Okay, so rectal cancer. You know, uh, if you have metastatic uh, rectal or colon cancer, it's a problem. Unless it's, you know, you're, you're probably not going to get cured. There's some, uh, but, but not very many. Um, if you have stage one, of course, it's gastroenterologist or surgeons or whatever, you get rid of it. But it's the stage two and three that really remain this major on that need because, um, in fact, it, the, the most advances in rectal cancer therapy over the course of the last 20 years has been trying to figure out, you put radiation with chemotherapy or before chemotherapy? Uh, do you put it uh, or with surgery or after surgery? And then they just keep going in all these cycles and everybody keeps publishing papers and they think that there's a marginal gain and then something comes out later and it's, uh, that it turns out it's worse or whatever. So people haven't made a ton of advances to this. Um, so we have to focus on locally advanced rectal cancer. Uh, and this just shows that, that for locally advanced, uh, the five-year mortality or look at it survival either way, survival is, about, is somewhere between 50 and 90% uh, disease-free survival. But that's still up to 50% of people who haven't achieved uh, a cure. And it doesn't occur just in, the, just in the rectum. Most of these end up being at distant sites. Uh, the other problem with rectal cancer is that uh, it can be, when it's low, um, it can involve the anal sphincter. And then if you get surgery, uh, it's, you, you're dealing with incontinence and everything else for the, for the rest of your life or colostomy. So that's why we try to treat this aggressively. <clears throat> So we really need therapies that are going to improve survival, um, including from metastatic <clears throat> disease and then reduce side effects. Uh, if you get a, uh, so if you're fortunate enough to have, if you're fortunate to be uh, in the 3% of rectal cancers that get, that is MSI high, um, then you can uh, get a PD-1 inhibitor. And there's some very exciting uh, data. And I put this up. This was the original for colon cancer, the NUGM article in 2015. And then more recently, last year, they had this amazing paper where instead of giving them radiation or um, uh, uh, chemotherapy or anything, they just plugged away at, at PD-1 inhibitors. And a lot of people got rid of their cancer over the course of, of uh, six or eight months. But it took a while to get rid of it. Um, it was it was an impressive study. I can't remember how many it was, 50, 60 something people, but it turns out it's only because it was done with MSK. And then they see so many rectal cancers that, that 3% actually represented uh, you know, 70 patients. That just shows that MSI are, are uncommon. Okay, this is the this is the, the, the pathway. Um, Idea for a point. Yeah, I guess maybe I can do this. Yeah. Well, I guess, I guess, yeah. Okay. So, um, so tryptophan can be metabolized. Tryptophan, uh, essential amino acid, important amino acid. You have to take it in. Uh, it's required for, of course, building blocks of protein. But uh, ninety-five percent of the tryptophan that's not metabolized to um, pro uh, that's not built into protein is actually metabolized down this chimerian pathway. And uh, of course, you can also be metabolized towards serotonin. And we think a lot about serotonin, particularly around uh, Thanksgiving time or, or other things. Um, 
but, but this kind of pathway is tremendously important. And it can be important in a, um, in a variety of ways. So one thing, um, these kynearnines are metabolically active metabolites, uh, and they have some differences. I'm not going to get too deep into it, but I can tell you that kynearnic acid is sort of a special um, metabolite that seems to have opposite effect of some of the other metabolites. But anyway, it can also be uh, produced to quinolinic acid, which can serve as a de novo source of NAD and so for resistance to chemotherapy and other things. Most of the study of, um, um, of tryptophan metabolism from the uh, late 90s was basically focused on the idea that this was a tolerance promoting enzyme. And so if it was expressed in the placenta, uh, the mother would not reject her pups. And if it was not, if they knocked it out uh, in the placenta that they would then immunologically reject her pups. So then of course, with time that became interested in, in the cancer space, which is what we're going to talk about now. I was initially interested in this in the in, uh, in inflammatory bowel disease. I still have some interest in inflammatory bowel disease. But the thing is, is that you have a, a because this is a cytokine induced enzyme. So in inflammatory bowel disease, you have interferons and TNF and whatever, and these can all induce IDO. And then it can act as a natural break to ongoing inflammation. And we got uh, at least seven years of funding out of that. But the, the issue is, is that with chronic inflammation, you also have the development of cancer. And uh, so then we thought, well, this could be a problem as well in IBD. If you, if you try to increase this enzyme to decrease the inflammation, you may be promoting cancer. I actually don't think that's the, the case uh, when we have some data, but I'm not going to show it. Um, but the point is that it has immune-related effects. I would say that a lot of our work has actually focused that in addition to immune effects, that there's direct effects within the tumor cell. And I'm going to tell you more about that. So this was... Uh, this is just from TCGA, an obligatory TCGA slide where you measure the enzyme, you know, measure the lever of your protein and, and compare things. So anyway, you can see that compared to the other tryptophan metabolizing enzymes, that IDO1 has a higher expression than most of those. And it's the only one that actually has been associated as poor, uh, for poor prognosis. So in this case, this was a, a histopathology uh, you know, clinical outcomes paper, but basically when IDO1 was expressed at the tumor margin, um, that patients had worse outcome. So high ideal expression, worse outcomes. I have a quick question. Did the, uh, did the ideal levels correlate with the inflammatory signature of the tumor? Because uh, you just said that that would potentially induce uh, 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 So I, um, um, we haven't put that, we have some, some uh, parts of that as far as the subtypes like this. Uh, colon cancers are divided into CMS 1, 2, and 3, 4, and some of them are more inflammatory. Uh, it does look like in those that IDO is overexpressed. Um, so this was early on in the field, but basically we you know, took an IDO knockout mouse and we gave it uh, colitis-associated cancer, and it turns out that in the uh, IDO knockout mice that they... Um, uh, oops, oops here. Yeah, so in the IDO knockout mice, then they had less, uh, less cancer. So IDO1 promoting uh, cancer. But we also found what was very interesting is that IDO1 was uh, in, the, in the wild type mice compared to the knockout is, is that the knockout had very little nuclear beta catenin. And of course, beta catenin and wind signaling is important in, in colon cancer. So this started us to thinking that there was an effect not just on the immune system, but directly within the tumor cells. Uh, so we then work to dissect the, this apart. And this was actually probably one of my more mechanistic papers in many ways. And so I'm very happy that it's been cited, you know, now a uh, hundred plus uh, times in a, short, uh, uh, in a short period of time. But I guess, you know, that's the importance of publishing mechanism like that people really like that you basically found that in fact, kynurinines didn't integrate with the wind signaling pathway, but they instead integrated with this AKT, with the PI3K AKT signaling. Uh, which is another inflammatory pathway to promote nuclear beta catenin. Um, so not a canonical wind ligand, et cetera. Um, and in addition to that, in this paper, uh, and I may show you a little bit of the data, but basically in this paper, we, we showed that if you knocked out IDO just in the epithelial cells, that it had the same effect. Um, and we, in this other paper, we've shown that if you knock out, um, if you cross an IDO knockout mouse, to a RAG knockout mouse. So if you remove adaptive immunity, that you still see the benefit as well. So there's a tumor, um, tumor cell intrinsic effect 
um, and something that's independent of the immune system. That, that, uh, this paper was published in Gastro uh, when, um, uh, I'm trying to think of who was the editor in, in the mid two thousand uh, in 2012. Was it Emil Ruski or was it, uh, was it at, after that? Anyway, I owe them a lot uh, because they publish it there, and I think that that sort of does, you know, you get a good paper like that, and it does sort of change your, change your trajectory. So then, uh, and I'm going to show you a little bit more data on this, but basically we um, uh, said, um, so, so now you know that you have an effect uh, with the immune system, with, uh, independent of the immune system, um, but the dependent, the, the epithelial-centric uh, mechanism of this involves a pathway that's important um, not only for neoplastic growth, but for resistance to cell death. So AKT is a classic anti-apoptotic uh, pathway. And so when you have this enzyme producing uh, kinurenes, now you're uh, preventing apoptosis, you're promoting proliferation, and you're also changing the immune, uh, immune environment. So, uh, so what causes apoptosis? Of course, radiation and chemotherapy and other things cause uh, apoptosis. And so that led us to say, we know that radiation um, is a treatment for rectal cancer. We know that that is an easy way to test inducing apoptosis. So basically, uh, and it's also, um, it's also a way that you can examine the immune system in a couple of, uh, a couple of ways. And the way you do this is, is that you can take a, a wild type mouse, and you can put a tumor um, on one side, uh, on both sides. And then when you radiate the mouse, you can radiate only one side. Um, and so the effect uh, of combination with radiation you're seeing specifically on the side that's radiated, the lead shielded side, you can look at the immune effects and things that are independent of the actual radiation. So that led, led us to the question, can you examine this in humans who are, are getting radiation for their rectal cancer? So now I'm just going to show you a few more of the data slides. This is more of the beta catenin stuff. Um, and uh, for people that like looking at mouse colon tumors, then this is the mouse colon tumor picture where the knockout had uh, much fewer, uh, smaller tumors. And so then we generated this uh, epithelial knockout mouse. It looks like I switched the sides of them, but basically uh, the intestinal epithelial cell knockout also had smaller tumors compared to the wild type. And this effect of, of nuclear beta catenin was, was still very intact. Um, this is a tunnel assay in, um, uh, in these tumors, and you can see the knockout had a lot more cell death. And we counted that up as well. So this is the signaling for this is the signaling for AKT. So you know it takes a while to get beta catenin into uh, it takes it, it's a um, uh, the wind signaling takes a little bit longer, but AKT signaling can be very quick. So basically, with within five minutes, either the proximate uh, step of this kinurenine or the distal step of uh, of a kind of uh, quinolinic acid could induce this very rapid. Um, it had no effect on canonical wind signaling. Had a very rapid induction in AKT, GSK3 uh, beta, and then beta catenin as well. Very impressive. Okay, so now we're moving into the um, jump forward. So this just shows you that if you use uh, that radiation itself can induce IDO within the tumors, um, and it does it in an interferon dependent way. Within the tumor cells itself, it does it in a type one interferon uh, way. And then but in the, whole, um, for the tumor cells in vitro, but if you do it in, uh, in vivo, then it also involves interferon gamma as a potent stimulant. And you can see that, that that happened regardless of whether this was MC38 is a, MC, is a MSI high tumor <laughs> or immune, uh, immune active tumor. CT26 is a, more of like a fibroblast uh, colon cancer type. And then HCT116 is a, is a human one. But ideal goes up in all of those. <clears throat> so
So how do you radiate, um, how do you radiate rectal cancer? Um, as I said, there's different strategies. So a lot of times people have been combining the chemotherapy, 5-FU, uh, um, with radiation, and they would give five weeks of radiation. And so you would be getting um, you would get immune suppression while getting the radiation. More recently, and it particularly advanced over the course of the pandemic, is that people got their radiation all at the beginning. So they would get five doses of radiation, and it would be separated for a couple of weeks from the immune suppressive chemotherapy. So we thought, but we had been doing this at WashU for many years already. And so we thought to ourselves that this was kind of a unique opportunity and system where you could, uh, if you're taking something that engages or activates the immune system um, with radiation, that it would be nice to separate that from the immune suppressive chemotherapy. And, and this, so, but no one really knows what happens in the rectal cancer when you do this because uh, uh, most of the people offering radiation or, or chemotherapy are not gastroenterologists, so they don't get a biopsy before and after um, uh, radiation or chemotherapy. But because we had this unique cohort where we had one time had been sending people through radiation, and then uh, the next week we would take them immediately to surgery. So we had a, a collection of samples like this. And you can just see that uh, in the short period of time that this is IDO expression goes way up. And this is a composite of all the various different uh, uh, patients we had. But also you create this immune suppressive environment where you're seeing a lot of infiltration of T regulatory cell, FOXP3 positive T regulatory cells after this radiation. So if you give the IDO inhibitor uh, with um, uh, radiation, and in this case with this index tumor, and I'm showing the data for the ledge, uh, for the uh, index tumor that's radiated, um, and you give epicanistat all along the way, that you can radiate, uh, radiate a couple of times, you induce IDO, and you can see that the combination of, in down here in green, which is radiation plus epicanistat, is superior to either the epicanistat alone, radiation alone, or the control. Again, limiting some of the data. The other thing that's really was amazing is, is, that, uh, is that the contralateral tumor, the honor radiated tumor, looked exactly the same. Uh, it had the same benefit of the dual therapy. And so there's this thing in radiation that's been a big, you know, it's a lot of interest in using radiation as an immune stimulant. Um, and there's an effect called the Ebscopal effect that you may have heard of where basically people, it started with melanoma. If you, re, if you radiated the melanoma in their leg, that they might, that you might get regression of melanoma in their liver, sorry, liver, uh, as a gastroenterologist, you have that right. But the, um, so, so that's the abscopal, uh, abscopal effect. So now we're seeing basically the potentiation of this abscopal effect. Um, I will say that the radiation alone was a little bit, uh, was not as particularly effective, but particularly with the ideal answer it was. So we have a therapy that can uh, relieve radiation-induced immune suppression. So these are our uh, T effector cells to T regulatory cells. And you can see that, um, that radiation reduces this, reduces the number of uh, immune, uh, the number of uh, tumor attacking T cells. Uh, it relieves, it's relieved by epigatostat and epigatostat cell increases it. We we're also able to enhance direct cytotoxicity of the radiation therapy. And so this is KS67 positive cells. And you can see again that the combination is, it has the least proliferation. And then cleaved caspase nine uh, or three, that this is the, the most uh, extended cell. And then finally, uh, what I think is tremendously, was tremendously exciting is, is that basically that, um, the biggest side effect and why you can't give more, why you don't give radiation in part to the colon um, is because the colon moves around and there's too much small intestine in the field. So a major side effect of radiation is, is essentially radiation induced enteropathy. Um, in the rectum, you can do some things where you organize the rectum and you have, now they have uh, various types of like radiation where you can focus more radiation there, but it shows that, um, uh, uh, but radiation induces diarrhea as a side effect, and it's a dose limiting side effect. One way that you can look at small intestinal damage is by looking at the, the number of uh, what are called uh, surviving trips after radiation. So if you radiate the mouse's abdomen, you can then look at see how many of those epithelial crypts have survived. Um, and you can see here that uh, this is a weak IDO inhibitor. This is the strong IDO inhibitor that we're using, and this is the IDO knockout mice. 
that the number of surviving crypts is much higher than these. Meanwhile, the stem cell region is still based here, you know, somewhere, somewhere from one to, to five, depending on how you've looked at the stem cell region, that's not correct. But you can see that the epicatastat or the IDO inhibition decreases uh, the, uh, the uh, stem cell apoptosis in the small intestine. So now you have uh, an approach that activates the immune system that uh, also increases cytotoxicity within the tumor cells itself and also protects the normal small intestine from radiation injury. So we, uh, and that's, I, I put this together for the grant and it's very nice, but I, I won't go through all the details, but you can see that that's the summary of it. Um, so we put together this as a phase one uh, B2 study of basically combining this IDO inhibitor, epigantostat, to preoperative radiation and chemotherapy in patients with locally advanced rectal cancer. Unfortunately, as we were starting to get closer to putting this out, it was a little bit earlier, but basically this drug had been used in, um, uh, uh, had been combined with PD-1 inhibitors in uh, uh, melanoma. And they used it at a very low dose, and they just wanted to get this drug, you know, figure out how to get this drug on market. It turns out that they had never had preclinical modeling that showed that this was a good idea to use either this dose or to combine it with PD-1 and melanoma. Um, they didn't have the same preclinical data and rationale that we've generated. And, um, and so uh, this was the effect, um, or rather, there wasn't an effect. <laughs> <laughs> So, so that's so that's kind of created a problem, right? Because then this uh, you know this pathway you're interested in basically is that all the pharma companies you can see just pulled out uh, you know their their billions of dollars of investment into this. Um, I I used to have a Zig Ziglar quote. I don't know if you've ever seen Zig Ziglar quote. You can just look at the internet. He's got a bunch of them. Uh, but anyway, failure to. Uh, um, uh, failure is simply the opportunity to begin again and, and this time more intelligently. I don't think we had to totally begin again, but we did have to sort of begin again in the fight uh, to say, why is this relevant? How can we, um, uh, how can we move this forward? And that's really from that point is where we were really advancing the radiation side of things because we said, well, look, you can't just give this drug alone. You can't give it, you know, with a PD-1 inhibitor. We're going to have to look at where the where the preclinical rationale is, and so that's a lot of where we developed the radiations after this uh, trial, early trial results. But we have a lot of good reasons. Uh, epicatastat and melanoma failed. Uh, they had insufficient dosing. Uh, they they never looked ahead of time to see if any of these patients express IDO. And in fact, in melanoma, uh, less than thirty percent express IDO one. Um, uh, and they didn't have this good scientific rationale. So we ended up starting this trial where we're using, I think, more uh, rationally selective dosing, so 300 to 600 milligrams, um, but you needed a higher, uh, and by the way, there are PK studies and there are other, um, there, there are uh, studies of pharmacodynamic studies where they measure kynurenine in the blood. There was no effect at the 100 milligram dosing. So they completed this huge trial, even though they weren't seeing the systemic uh, uh, effect. So. Uh, but you can see an effect at this 300 and 600 dose. Uh, and then the other thing is, is, that, is that radiation induces this enzyme. So every patient uh, who gets the therapy, you know that that tumor is going to ex express now the new target of your therapy, uh, the, the new target. So we developed this clinical trial, and, uh, not to, to go too deep in the details, but basically when you're developing a phase one uh, safety trial, which is what the FDA required, because they didn't know it's never been combined with um, uh, with with chemotherapy uh, in the GI tract, and so they wanted to make sure that it didn't cause everyone to get colitis and have all these problems. So we started at 300 milligrams, which uh, which worked. Uh, then we went to 600 milligrams. Turns out at 600 milligrams that a lot of patients got a drug rash. Um, even though this drug rash went away a couple of days after you removed it, it still was a present drug rash. And um, uh, so we had to dial it back down to 400. But basically, in our study, people are getting, we get a biopsy at baseline, uh, and we can measure the ideal expression, the tumor microenvironment, et cetera. They get their radiation. They're getting the epicanacet all on the way. We have this two-week break where the immune system can be activated. And then we... Uh, um, offer them strongly encourage the opportunity to get another uh, uh, flexible sigmoidoscopy 
and a biopsy so that then we can have post radiation related work. And then, of course, we're collecting serum and stool and all those other things along the way. And they get chemotherapy, and then eventually you get the tumor at the time of tissue. It is amazing to see some, how some of these rectal cancers in three weeks uh, go from something that looks like, um, well, on a, on, a, on a screen, it looks like a cantaloupe or something, but on the endoscopy screen. But anyway, it's probably the size of a, 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 a super large walnut or something, and, and then can shrink down so fast and just with the radiation therapy. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a bunch of scores. Uh, we're collecting you know, tissues, samples, uh, stool, all of those things along the way, and we have a system for doing that. This is the preliminary results. Uh, our radiation oncologist had another trial going on, which is another lesson. Like when you start a clinical trial, you have to make sure that you can get your patients in, uh, enrolled. So they had another trial where they kind of wanted the early stage, like the stage two rectal cancers. So they gave us all of their T4, N2, uh, like the most difficult, uh, challenging people. Um, but you can see that over the course from the time of the stage of diagnosis to their surgical stage is that you had a significant reduction. So this is T4 and 2 down to a T3 and N1. This one actually was not a particularly high, but the rest of these all went down T0, N0. Everybody got rid of their nodes, uh, uh, node positivity, the tumor shrunk, et cetera. And you can have this score, which is called the neoadjuvant rectal cancer score, it has a complex formula, but essentially it takes the um, the diagnostic step, uh, the stage of diagnosis subtracts away uh, the stage at the time of surgery, and then you get some system where you get a score. Anyway, if your score is low, it's better. If your score is above 15, it's bad. If it's less than uh, nine, it's good. In fact, very good. Um, like like five year, like 100% five years of life. Um, so anyway, you can see in the early stages, but we have even these very bad tumors have had low NAR scores. So we're excited about it. Uh, it's always nice to see one person's tumor shrink from that to nothing. Um, rashes we talked about. So one of the things that we thought was important is to be able to measure the activity of the enzyme within, um, within the tumor. And so we partnered with this guy at Wayne State University, and we've now, uh, now tested this in, in rectal cancer patients, but basically we can get a functional PET CT scan where you can measure tryptophan metabolism within the tumor, um, and and you and we can get pre and post uh, treatment radiation, et cetera, uh, and and measure the efficacy of the drug besides just measuring serum chimerine levels and uh, tissue samples and all that stuff. Um, and this just is an example of um, uh, 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 this is the rectal cancer here in different views, uh, for all sagittal views. Um, and this is the bladder, so the bladder is always filling up, but you can see the tumors lighting up. And in fact, I had more time points, but I didn't get them. But you see also the heterogeneity within the tumor, where like this area, you have a particularly hot focus um, uh, and other areas of the, of the tumor may be Oh yeah, I should have shown that. Then we're gonna do, we've, we've created a way to do uh, um, organoids and mini tumoroids and these sort of things that we can test. So now you can run a co-clinical trial outside of the patient as well. Um, you can, uh, uh, with the drug and then or, uh, along with it and see if, whether you predict whether it's gonna work or not. We can do the you know, multiplex uh, uh, immunohistochemistry eventually, uh, all the other things. See, circulating tumor DNA, we can measure what happens over the course of time, which uh, mutations might be continuing to go. And this is just one example of somebody that just with the radiation themselves totally cleared out their uh, circulating tumor DNA. And then this is, is a small number, but it's also interesting to look to see that in the, we had a couple of trial patients and, and uh, this actually represents a couple of control patients. Um, but the trial patients you can see the tumor after uh, um, treatment, that the epicanocytes seem to shift them more towards uh, a higher cytotoxic lymphocytes, higher NK cells, increasing neutrophils, and then actually a decrease in fibroblast. So some multiple benefits along the way. Biomarkers, I, I do want to show some other data, so I'm not going to go for, further into but biomarkers. You can measure the, meta uh, the metabolites, um, uh, untargeted metabolomics and find um, um, 
find some amazing things, maybe this is the best thing to look at. So basically, uh, this is this is the treated patients at baseline, control patients at baseline. So these should be the same, and they are. These are the control patients after um, uh, radiation. And then this is a particular metabolite we picked out but with epicatastat after <clears throat> radiation. So there's a poss possibility of identifying some other ones. Okay, so that's an example of a clinical trial started with mouse, mouse models, cultures, et cetera. It took like 10, 10 years, 12 years to get there to give you an idea. But I'm slower than some scientists. So if you guys have an idea, uh, um, I'm going to give you some tips at the end on how to move things a little faster. Okay. Valfer, are you ready? I'm set. In 10 minutes, Hudka and alternative colitis. We have therapies that treat cytokines. We have therapies that, uh, um, that prevent T cells from getting out of the lymph nodes or getting out of uh, getting out of the blood and into the tissue. But what we don't have, even though we know that there's a very important role for the epithelium, is that we don't really have therapies that specifically target um, problems within the epithelial cells. Um, and one of the main issues or one of the main outcomes in ulcerative colitis is how do you get that epithelial or barrier layer to get healed? We also don't really have my we don't really have microbiome therapies for IgD, IgD. So the epithelium is really at the center of the genetics, the immune response. Micro, uh, this is an old slide. They call it microbial flora, the you know, micro, uh, microbiome and environmental factors. And one thing that's been clear, particularly with some of our, our uh, genetic studies, is that stress within the endoplasmic reticulum and the ability to be able to deal with that within the cell so that the cell doesn't become apoptotic and die is, uh, is an important pathway. And so if you so you can look for ways to relieve that stress um, uh, uh, and, and allow the cells to live. So it turns out that this secondary bile acid called toro or so deoxypolic acid <clears throat> can relieve that ER stress. What is uh, toro urso deoxycholic acid? So it turns out that um, it's you know related to urso deoxycholic acid, secondary bile acid. It's a taurine conjugate. Uh, it was found in, in the uh, uh, bears, mostly uh, most highly in these Asian bears. So there's a big issue that people would kill a bear and get their gallbladder for all the good uh, uh, hutka in it. Uh, but then that became uh, illegal. So not surprisingly, now it turns out you can get a bug to do it. So. You can just make it in a, in a jar. One of our now faculty, Sian, uh, uh, Stuart Cow, and then Randy Kaufman. Um, obviously, it's a better picture of Randy than, than Stuart, but, the, um, but basically, if they had studied this by giving uh, Tudka to mice, and uh, probably everyone's familiar with DSS figures, but one thing you look for, like weight loss and, and uh, histology, et cetera. But essentially, you can see that if you gave Tudka, that they had less weight loss in this over the course of time. They had uh, lower disease activity or rectal bleeding scores and uh, all the histology scores as well. And then they also did it uh, as a salute to, to UNC. They also did it in IL-10 knockout mice. I don't know how they did it or where they got them or Anyway, so we also took this, I just used the same slide, but I put in a new thing. So anyway, we, now we took this also, this Tudka to uh, um, clinical trials. This looks busy, um, so don't, you don't have to look up there, but you can just understand that we're doing sort of the same thing, right? You get patients who have active disease, you do an endoscopy, you collect all their biospecimens, you put them through some uh, various different questionnaires to see how severe their disease is, um, and you can quantify that on an endoscopy as well. We did six weeks of treatments. Whether you do six weeks, eight weeks, uh, four weeks, I'm not sure, but six weeks is what we were recommended to be by the uh, um, uh, by Balfour and the other reviewers at the Lipman Foundation or at that time. Um, uh, um, the Hel no, not Helsley. What was it called? The, what was it before the Lipman? Oh, bro. The Bro. The Bro. Um, so, anyway, this was an interesting grant. It took a while to get the grant funded, but anyway. Um, and then you do it again six weeks later. And then we also did some further things later on down the way. So we put uh, 14 people through, 13 people completed the protocol and found speakers uh, safe and well-tolerated. 
A couple of people stopped taking their five ASAs. I have no idea. The problem is they stopped taking their rectal five ASAs. Um, and so when you do that and you already have active disease, but then they, they tend to not do as well. But this is a big picture of the results is that this is a total Mayo score, which is composed of endoscopy, rectal bleeding and histology, uh, or sorry, rectal bleeding and then their uh, diarrhea score. And you can see that almost all, actually all patients, all patients had an improvement in their total Mayo score over the course of six weeks, highly significant. The endoscopy score uh, also reduced significantly over these week six. And then rectal bleeding, um, uh, rectal bleeding impressively got better at week two, and then it was almost non-existent by week uh, four and six. And so this is really kind of like, these are, are amazing outcomes, uh, uh, the and the histology got better. There was one patient who threw us off, I guess, um, and we'll show her later too. So this was the total, uh, these are the people that got out of the, this is actually, if you count them up, there's uh, 11, I guess. Um, but five of these 11 got lethal healing, uh, seven of the 11 got clinical response, and then uh, two of them got the total clinical remission. That's just an example of a, of a patient. Uh, the fecal calprotectin went down in everybody except for this one person. Um, that's kind of annoying because there's nothing you can do about statistics unless you just, uh, you know, ex uh, conveniently exclude this person. So that statistically wasn't significant, plus health protection is all over the place. But the bottom line is that most patients showed this biomarker of improvement as well. C-reactive protein went down in the, you know, everybody except for the same person actually, and then their quality of life went up. We looked at, um, these are mucosal biopsies pre and post, and we created essentially a comparison. And when, when it's red, that means you're getting better. And when it's uh, blue, that means it's going, or it's going, it's increasing or blue, it's going down. Anyway, the number of colonocyte, markers of colonocytes went up, goblet cells went up, of course, there's goblet cell depletion in ulcerative colitis. Stem cells, uh, some of them went up anyway. Um, uh, these wound associated epithelial cells, which is a longer story, uh, that some of those went uh, up or down. ER stress genes went down, and all of these are significant. All of these are highly significant. They had to be less than one uh, less than one percent to get into this. Inflammation went down, and neutrophils went down. Who do you put on Tudka um, if you're going to do it? You know, do you do this instead of five ASAs? Do you do this in, uh, uh, instead of mesalamines? Do you do it uh, uh, instead of Probably not instead of a, um, a TNF alpha inhibitor or something like that. So we just allowed anyone. We just allowed anybody. They had to have a Mayo score of six. They had to have moderate or severe disease. Our average Mayo score was nine. So this is high moderate to severe disease. Um, and you can see that people were on uh, some were up. A lot of people were on five ASAs. Some people were on prednisone, uh, infliximab. You know. More than half the patients were on some, or more than 60% of the patients were already on a biologic for a small molecule. So this looks like it could be an adjunct uh, therapy. Uh, so in this open label phase one trial, moderately severe ulcerative colitis, but with, um, with quantitative measures that we did see uh, that Tudka was well tolerated. It worked regardless of other therapies. Um, it uh, associated with clinical response, mucosal healing, and led to a decrease in ER stress. I do have some bile acid data that we measured that we could never make uh, sense of. I, I have a correlation thing that says that if the Tudka levels correlate with, uh, with um, improvement in Mayo score, but I'm not sure that it's, I'm not sure how valuable that is. The microbiome data alone, we weren't able to decipher with these smaller populations, but we did get that. But now we have grown organoids from all of these patients, and I don't have this um, piece of data in because we're still working on it. But it does look like patients who responded to Tudka, that their um, that their organoids in the setting of stress um, actually tended to have um, uh, tended to have somewhat lower um, ER stress markers um, before they got Tudka, and then after you give them Tudka. Oh, it took down the ER stress in all of the overlays. So, so that may be a marker of, of predicting whether or not the therapy works. So uh, we're still working on some of that and we're preparing for a phase two trial.
it took a lot of people to do this and more even than more even than is here but but a, a big shout out to um Randy Kaufman my co-PI on this um uh, my uh Division Chief Nick Davidson, who's, who's been a big support, our other collaborators, and then of course of many of our and study coordinators. <laughs> okay, so these are the lessons. Um, so first of all, uh, how did I find out about giving IDO in rectal cancer, or how did I make that that trial happen? I presented at the oncology division oncology research conference like this, and afterwards, um, a pre GI oncologist and a neuro oncologist came up to me. And they said, let's do something with it. Um, and so that's basically took us to the next step. And we went to the company and we wrote, you know, started writing protocols. The neuro-oncologist created a unique protocol that combines uh, like an anti-neovascularization uh, uh, drug plus PD-1 plus epicatastat for patients with recurrent plus radiation for patients with recurrent glioblastoma. So we grew some glioblastoma cells and showed that radiation also increases in this. Her trial, her, she did a phase two, uh, 2A trial, so 20 patients in each group, and it's, um, and it's, it's nearly done. Um, so far, those, you know, if you have recurrent glioblastoma, the average life is about, it's like four to eight months or so. Um, there's people that have been, uh, she has, out of that 20, she has a handful that are living longer than two years. Like, amazing. What if you make an impact on, you know, uh, Glioblastoma. Um, you never know. So get out there. You got to listen to your audience and uh, and think about those. Uh, um, oh, I have a couple of words in there that I didn't plan, so don't worry about that. But anyway, present your stuff widely. Uh, don't ignore the word island. Um, uh, don't, I think it's a, don't be an island. I guess um, uh, prepare for the long game. Like I said, it took me twelve you know twelve years to to sort of get into this. By the way, that rectal cancer one was just. Funded, we think it was just funded uh, for a phase two trial with the NCI. Um, and, uh, and so now we're gonna be able to have a control group and, and put people through a bunch of procedures and all that stuff. So it's gonna be amazing. Um, so you gotta prepare to play that long game, but at the same time, so if you're playing a long game, you gotta think about what is the unmet need and is that unmet need going to be there in five years uh, down the road? Because if it takes you a long time to develop these things, you have to do that. You have to think, you have to expect uh, roadblocks and changes that are going to happen. You have to expect that trial that comes out where they you know, used a low dose of, of uh, epicatastat and it's not going to work. Um, but then you have to fight through uh, for what you think is, uh, you know, for what you think is right and what you believe is, is really is the pathway. Um, COVID shut things down a lot. That slowed us down tremendously. Um, but you got to develop things with uh, vision, uh, develop your vision with the end in mind. Um, so. With epicatastat, we already partnered with a drug company. Maybe we could have partnered with another drug company, but we have a way that we can get that to patients if it works. Um, and they'll support the fact they would they would uh, love us. They've maybe built me a house in Wellington if uh, um, uh, if, if, if it gets approved. But the um, uh, with Hudka, I think the story is a little bit more difficult because it is a uh, you know it's a nutritional supplement, and we've tried to figure out other ways to package it. You combine it with things. We've thought a lot of strategies. I'm interested if anyone else has other ideas, I'd be love to talk about it. Uh, think about your IP early, uh, because we did some work with probiotics early on that, that I think it had we genetically modified the probiotic or done something else that we could have made that I had IP. Collaborate, uh, you can't do it all, of course. Uh, and I think sometimes as GI doctors, we see patients at clinic, we prescribe things, we do procedures, you think maybe you can do it all, but you can't. Um, and you move too slow. So you have to get people that are, are better than you and move you forward. And then um, without your own passion and persistence, uh, that these things don't go, they just can't go anywhere because sometime along the way, you're gonna be the CEO, the CMO, the CFO, and the worker bee. Um, okay, so I think we did it. <laughs> Thank you. So, Matt, first of all, congratulations. Uh, I'm really pleased that uh, this really good idea panned out. And Thank you. It works highly, highly successful. So, figure out what happened to that one patient. Yeah. Um, she, she actually, she is a patient that had been on, we had her on her Flixmap Plus NTFE. I think right. actually on that on that thing, she, when she was on this trial, she was already on in Flixmap and NTFE. Oh, God. Um, yeah, so, so, we just, we didn't fix it. Yeah, well, maybe I'm fixable. 
Uh, so that question is on, on the uh, taurine contributed uh, versus the oxycholic acid. How important is the taurine? And what, because typically we think that uh, taric cholic acid, the TCA, and things like that, or increased vitamin B, tend to think it's a bad thing. You know, the taurine contributed vital acid. It's more toxic to cells. Is the is the taurine necessary? Uh, uh, is it contributory, or was that just there and used it? Yeah. So there's so much that you know. People actually, a lot of people have used cutca in their various different. Uh, you know, mouse colitis models and that sort of stuff. Nobody is, they all just say, oh, it treats ER stress. Nobody's really figured out. Taurine actually increases the uh, absorption of, of uh, urso deoxycholic acid as well. And so you may actually have higher systemic levels of this and whether or not, you know, where, where all the action is and whether it's in the epithelium cells alone, right. or whether it's in the innate lymphoid cells, which um, I think you saw it at, uh, you know, what now this guy, Stuart Cow is doing stuff with ILCs, just like, um, it's, a, it's amazing, um, but um, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to work. We gotta, somebody's gotta figure it out more because maybe Tuck is not the, the best drug. There was in the PSC clinical trials with urso deoxycholic acid that there was not, um, I, I have to look back at the data, but anyway, it wasn't It wasn't like a miracle cure for their ulcerative colitis along the way too. Right. Um, Otherwise, I guess we'd be using it. So maybe there's something special about it. I think you know more has to be done. Right, but may may increase absorption. Yeah. Interesting. John Hanson has a question on the chat. Um, I don't know if you want to unmute, or I can read it. Yeah. Hey, Matt. Uh, it's nice to hear your talk. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Hi, John. Uh, hey, I'll see you tomorrow. Um. I may have missed it, but other than the rash, were there any other potentially inflammatory side effects to the IDO inhibitor, especially if you combine it with checkpoint inhibitors? Yeah, so so uh, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, I think when you try to put too much in the talk, then you just uh, cut out important stuff. So we did not see any increase in in, um, in diarrhea in these uh, in, in these patients. We didn't see, in fact, um, uh, so epicatastat hasn't been used at this higher dose too much in trials. Um, uh, and the ones early ones that were going on got shut down. Uh, it's like I'm looking to that microphone for where John is. But he's, not, he's not really up there. So, the, uh, so I think it will be interesting to see. We did not see any other. There's no other sort of evidence like you see with immune checkpoint inhibitors. We just didn't see it. And I think that that's... Um, I, I think there's a couple things. So remember, this is a drug that has probably a short half-life of four hours. And so sort of like when we're using JAK inhibitors, that if we use lower dose JAK inhibitors, that you don't see as many of these side effects. But when you get, uh, at high, now obviously there's different JAKs as well, but if you get the higher dose or you have continuous knockout of it, that you see more of these side effects. And I think that that's also, you know, offers you a possibility of that, where it's sort of, uh, it breaks and then it lets a little go and it breaks and lets a little go. You can see that the cardio way through with cancer independent immune effect. However, I want to know because the locality uh, at the way at the CDC of the around here have a immune effect at two sides, one side in native, another adult, adoptive. Do, do you check the use effects for the immune cell or how you get the concluded magnetic? Independent yeah, so that, that was mostly from, so it's not totally independent of adaptive immunity, but when we crossed the knockout to the RAG knockout mice, um, and the effect was actually kind of crazy, it was, it was more pronounced in the RAG knockout mice compared, uh, in the double knockout, RAG plus IDO knockout compared to RAG knockout mice alone. Does that answer your question? No. Okay. Because the immune effect is too slight, in late the market, and and uh, dendritic cells and the adoptive T cells, you know any evidence for the if I compare the lockout that about the white out and lockout, no, no difference. That may be independent immune cell, immune effect. However, I know this but based on how you get the concluries independent immune effect. Um, I'm gonna have to think about it a little bit more, but maybe we can talk uh okay. talk about it. <clears throat> um, so how did you uh, so for the metabolite that you showed? Yeah. What was that metabolite that was up? 
pathways are coming up with the well that's unidentified metabolism. <clears throat> so well I mean it's unidentified. Yeah, it's, I mean it, it's so so uh um so many of these were unidentified. There are some that are identified, um, but since, since we have another moment to look at this this slide, so here here's so it's always confusing on how you label things and it takes you a while to figure it out. But anyway, remember the control baseline and the epicanistate baseline. These are this, this should be the same. They're untreated. Uh, and then some of them got radiation alone, which is radiation with epicanistate. So you can see that the blue, the light blue and the dark blue sit next to it. So this is one patient, this is one patient, and this is one patient. So their, their metabolic profile looked the same pre and post radiation in general. It grouped together. All of these over here are the epicanistat baseline, which all line up with the pre and post control treatment. Whereas all of the epicanistat, epicanistat treated all lined up over here with a, with a different profile. So many of these actually have identities, um, but I haven't paid my bill to the metabolomics score yet. And so I think they're withholding uh, further identification until I do. <laughs> and it's actually, a, you know. It's a true story. <laughs> yes. I'm curious about the road to both clinical trials. Yeah. For the first one, you showed like seven last author papers, 10 years of work, and then the clinical trial. Yeah. For the Tudco, you didn't show that. Was there a whole bunch of footwork to start the clinical trial where you're relying more on the literature in general? Yeah. So I would say that we were, I would say that when we started doing the, um, we did early radiation experiments with the IDO and, um, uh, and that, when we first started seeing an effect, we started thinking about developing and whether we could test this in, in patients. Um, we wrote an R21 to the NCI, which scored seventh percentile. This was 2018, um, but they, they funded it sixth percentile. Um, so the guy told us to write an R01, but it took us a while longer to write a, a, another R01 and COVID happened and all that sort of stuff. So we were sort of building that along the way and doing a little bit of the bootstraps, a little bit supported by um, Insight. With the Tudka, it was, I actually kind of, Balfour knew about Tudka before I did, I think, because Randy Kaufman had submitted um, this to the, um, I think, or it was going to be submitted to the, through, uh, initially to, to the road to be reviewed. And um, uh, there were a lot of problems with the trial. It was almost like it was written by somebody that doesn't write clinical trials. So then I took that on and ended up kind of rewriting it resubmitting it and then the road closed uh their funding for a while and then one december day i received uh you know a nice notice that said this congratulations this is fun this is like a year later but, you know congratulations this is funded um and uh it starts you know tomorrow so um Kind of, kind of. Yeah, you probably should do it three months. Well, yeah, that's right. right. So, so, um, uh, so then we had to get our, you know, get our butts in here, um, and that's and that's kind of how we did it. And we had a lot of problems with because we started this basically uh, uh, right at the beginning of COVID, and it took us a while to figure out. People love this. Patients love this. If you just say, "Oh yeah, you're already on, you know, Remicade, and you're not doing well. You want to take a dietary supplement." Um, they 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 sign up so we literally enrolled like six people um you know, maybe in, in a month and a half um uh for this so that was that actually moved pretty quickly and then there been some other other challenges along the way so but that's a good question right so when do you when do you make the leap and i think that's the thing is you just have to you know get the opinions of others try to figure out whether or not you have the ip whether you have an approach whether the problems will be there and then you know if the unmet need is Everyone's looking for something to treat the epithelial, you know, to improve the epithelial healing, right? But we don't really have uh, any, you know, it's not, it's it's ongoing. So there's still an open market for it. Um, so consult with people, or actually point one, go present your stuff and you never know, you might be at an oncology meeting and then before you know it, you've, uh, you've improved the uh, um, uh, glioblastoma. Another true story, my my cousin uh, was diagnosed with the glioblastoma, and it was, it was actually he's, he's doing okay for the moment. But anyway, he lived near Mayo Clinic, and the woman that I started this trial with moved to Mayo Clinic, and so they're running out of there. And so I was sort of thinking to myself, 
oh my gosh, what if we really you know, had something that eventually could impact my cousin's life? It would be amazing. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from John? <laughs> 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 okay.